working at the con while I'm trying to help make sure that we don't get in trouble. Um, that's really what my role is. I'm the policeman. I'm, I'm the ba I'm the babysitter to make sure that we don't get thrown out. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think it is. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Okay. Great. Um, so what we'll do is we'll do a quick introduction, and then we're gonna throw out some topics. And on the first topic, we'll we'll let uh, Mr. Drake start, and then he'll pass the mic down, and we'll all talk about the topic. And then uh, we definitely want to get some input, but it's definitely designed to be interactive. Uh, it's a panel discussion, and uh, we're just gonna throw out some talking points to just to kind of get everyone going on this topic. And uh, the, the the topic itself is on uh, like kind of career, you know, when it comes to infosec. Career could mean a lot of different things. You know, are you the beginning, the middle, the end? You know, where do you see things happening? So just real quickly, uh, I'm Mike Spalding. Um, I haven't, uh, I guess we, uh, technically, I guess Tom, uh, Tom is our, is our, uh, CISO. I mean, he's our CISO on this group. Uh, he's the most senior one. I've always been that favorite assistant to the CISO guy, you know, kind of like the bridesmaid, but never, never the bride. <laughs> and, uh, and I actually haven't had any alcohol to say that either. So, um, but yeah, uh, and, uh, I've worked for a number of different companies, uh, you know, and if you see my LinkedIn, you, you'll see what, who I worked for and all that good stuff. But um, worked for a lot of different entities, worked in Silicon Valley, and uh, a lot of different good experiences. So with that, I'll pass it over here to Chad. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Chad White. I am the owner and national recruiter for Rogue Talent based here in Columbus. Uh, do a lot of work, a lot of community involvement here locally in the InfoSec community. Um, like Mike, well, I haven't been at quite as many places as Mr. Spaulding here, but uh, I worked in the consulting business for a long time, about nine years until I decided to go rogue, if you will. And uh, focusing on perm placement, it's a much different uh, ball game, but it's a lot of fun working with varying levels um, of information security professionals these days. It's getting even more exciting, even when they told us back in, as we were talking, 05, that there was a peak. There's, We certainly haven't seen that yet. So... It's a great uh, community to work in, and I'll pass this to Valerie. All right, we have six alpha talkers and one microphone, so this is probably going to get pretty interesting later on. So uh, I'm Valerie Thomas. I work for uh, SecureCon. So we are based out of Washington, D.C., um, but as many of you know, uh, Connie Matthews, our sales rep, is based here. So it probably won't be too much longer before we open SecureCon North uh, in the Columbus area. Midwest, yeah, well, we have a South already. We have a mobile. We have a, a guy that just like drives around in his truck like all the time. <laughs> Seriously, it's, it's SecureCon Mobile. We slapped a big logo on the back of it, and that's, and that's that. Uh, so yeah, we're expanding along Columbus. So um, a little bit about what I do. Uh, I'm the principal security consultant there. Uh, we only have one principal, so I'm queen of the nerds. Uh, yeah, queen of the nerds, and they are nerdy. Uh, we do a lot of software and physical penetration testing, so I am a breaker of things. Um, been in and out of this for about 10 years. I started in the defense industry uh, and then switched over to the commercial side, and now SecureCon itself kind of dabbles in both, so now I kind of play both sides of the coin depending on what week of the month it is. Uh, but yeah, I've been mostly a technical focus my career. So um, I'll stop talking and pass it along. <laughs> Hi, my name's Lonnie Kelly. Um, if you were in one of the sessions earlier, you probably heard me rant on a little bit more than you wanted to. Um, but that's okay, you're still here. Um, so I actually work for the security software company that a lot of people like to hate, um, Semantic. And so um, I'm actually a lead technical architect in the professional services group. Um, my main focus is DLP. And um, and it's been a fun ride so far. And in my past, I've worked with Mike on the, uh, the security side, have worked on EHTs, um, stood up uh, application security programs and done standards, the whole gamut of things, including management. And so just kind of finding myself at more interesting places in my life right now because I have not followed a traditional route, per se, um, along my security journey. Well, some of you would have heard my background earlier, so I wouldn't elaborate, but there was a time when I was at NSA before everything happened and what happened to me occurred, I was actually a uh, one of the senior executives. I was a technical director for software engineering implementation and a process portfolio manager. 
I actually led a uh, very innovative lab. Uh, it was a software engineering center where um, the NSA had identified back in the 90s when it was first uh, created. They realized they had a real uh, software challenge um, and that they needed to bring in best practices. So over a period of years, I was aligned with that as a contractor. And we went to the far ends, essentially, of the United States and even overseas to find best practices in terms of software engineering, test engineering, quality engineering, database, uh, modeling, development, a whole range, of, all the range of the disciplines, domain engineering. And so, so it's this really like a skunk works in which uh, we, we did a lot of really interesting and innovative things. Uh, I personally... Uh, was was certified in industry as a software test engineer, so I used to analyze uh, well systems and software uh, systems and system of systems. But on a very specific specific level, I analyze hundreds and hundreds of millions of lines of code of all kinds. Um, Security, uh, security analysis, covert channel analysis, firmware of all types, uh, in network router boxes. Uh, you, you name the device that had software in it, we analyzed it. We also used to do a lot of organizational scans where we'd come in and look at the health of an organization. So I got increasingly involved in organizational and leadership development, um, on the, you know, te the technical management side of things. And in industry, I'll just leave you with this. Um, during the go-go 90s, I spent a lot of time out in Silicon Valley. Some, some really, uh, you know, cool companies, nondescript, some, you know, in some office park that you didn't recognize. You had an address and a Ethernet, um, cable hooked up to, you know, internet, uh, developing the next killer app, right? And some, in fact, did develop one of the killer apps. Uh, but back then, you didn't know that they were doing that, right? And so part of the problem was how do you bring to market something that no one knows about that's really cool that no one has ever used to know that it's really cool? So that is a very, very small nutshell uh, is as part of my you know, information security and system software engineering uh, background. Does anybody have a question that they want to ask? If not, what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and uh, throw out some kind of some questions to kind of get the dialogue going. Okay. Um, so, so I'll go ahead and I'll say the first one. So here's the first question, and then I'll pass it to, to Chad. Uh, although it might be good to have Tom kind of comment on this first when we come back the other way, is... From a uh, education and certification standpoint, what is it that you look for in the ideal candidate? Start down the heart. <laughs> the, the principal, you know, it's interesting because I work full time at Apple now. So uh, as an expert, <laughs> ironically enough, in one of the retail stores in the greater DC area, uh, it's high tech, high touch. It's it's and it's more focused on high touch. You can't just know the technology. You also have to know. Um, all of those intangibles, sort of, the, sort of the space of relationships, the space of connectedness, the space of cooperation, collaboration. Those are critical skills. Those are much harder to teach. Um, even Apple's recognized, I'll just speak sort of at large with Apple. They used to hire like geeks, only geeks. But they realized that when you have customers coming in the store or customers coming up to the Genius Bar, Guess what? You have to be able to relate to them. You have to be able to have a conversation with them. You have to be able to look them in the eye. You have to be able to understand what their problem is. So it's a combination of both. Um, one of the things I have found is that a lot of, so I say the new generation, interesting enough, they're far more familiar with mobile devices than they are with computers. And so we're losing, I have to say this, and I realize I'm more classically trained in that regard. You know, I grew up with a command line. <laughs> um, and there's times I go there because that's the best solution. Uh, most, what's a command line, let alone bring up a terminal window, right? God, that looks weird. It's even green colored. Yeah. So... What's Emacs, right? Or even Edit, for that matter. Yeah, bring back some memories, right? <laughs> but the high-tech, high-touch, because a lot of this, so much of the technology is transparent. You don't see it until there's a problem. And that's where a lot of sort of my cl classically trained in terms of uh, software quality assurance and test engineering and system engineering, um, how do you do uh, problem analysis? You know, fishbone diagrams. What's causal? Um, 
because you have to understand what, what's at issue. And especially in our complex worlds, you've got systems now that are built with you know, umpteen lines of code. It's not, it's not the simple days when I first programmed on an Atari 8-bit, which you pretty much command the entire, you know, the entire set of commands um, uh, and pretty much do anything you wanted to once, once, once you knew it. That's not the case anymore. People increasingly have to work in teams or they're working across disciplines or they're actually working, working in you know, distributed, geographically distributed. Um, when I was in Silicon Valley, uh, it was not uncommon at all that it was 24 hours. You would have teams waking up in Australia, you know, 12 hours later, you know, 10, 12 hours later, having to communicate. Um, those kinds of dynamics. So, how do you work in those kind of environments? And uncertainty. Um, you're not. It's not always known. Uh, the ability to flex. Those become critical critical attributes that are, that are necessary. That I believe in this space, not just the technology. On the other hand, you can't. It's hard. I have to say this. People that have hands-on, people that like getting into it, uh, tend tend to thrive uh, more. Um, Especially if it's more organic in nature, wanting to learn, you know, it's taking apart stuff, even taking apart stuff virtually. Uh, that's one of the nice things about software because it's so fungible. <laughs> so, and then, you know, playing with it on hardware. So, that's what I would see as some of the key characteristics uh, necessary to su succeed in this space. Concur. No, <laughs> no. So, so yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, out. out. So it's a, it's a <laughs> so you know a lot. Of, I definitely agree. Uh, you know, with everything that you're saying for sure, and 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 so some of the things that I've noticed too, even more and more with um, with the younger generation that's kind of up and coming. Those you know in the teens, and I see this in my my own kids and their friends in high school, um, and even in the kids in the twenties, is that and and to me it's almost becoming a little bit lost, right? The the want to be more curious, right? To to get into it, and that yeah, it works great. It works the way I want it to. Why not maybe take it a step further? You know, that's great. Maybe you could think about something it couldn't do before, and try and push that limit, right? So, not saying go straight for the break fix, you know, right away, and and going into actually breaking it to hack it, but. That natural curiosity to make things better. I think that, you know, in a sense, some of the technology that we have right now, it's almost making um, some of the kids lazy, right? In the sense that they don't want to sit there and they don't want to type command line, and and it and it pains my kids to no great length when I make them and they're asking me things. I said, okay, if you want to learn this, we're going to sit down. And this is what we're going to do, and you know, and I'm like, okay, open up a text file. Uh, how do you do that? Google is your best friend. <laughs> and start to work them through, and it's like you're saying, a lot of the problem solving, you know, trying to get into that engineer mindset as well. Um, you know, certs, certs are good, certs are great, they serve a purpose, right? And, you know, people are probably gonna not like me so much for saying this, but it, a lot of times it's just to get your foot in the door, right? I know people who have certs that probably don't deserve to have the cert, but have it anyway. And um, you know, and they can talk conceptually about it all day. But when you put them in front of in front of a screen, and you're saying, "Okay, why don't you go ahead? Why don't you, you know, if you're in Linux, why don't you fire up a shell? Let's get into this a little bit. This is what I need you to run. This is what I need you to do. Change some environment variables. Do this and that." And they just kind of, "Huh? Okay." Well, we talked about that in class. We talked about that, you know, through the through the training. But having that practical hands-on, being able to say, "Okay." You know, not just get the, the deer in the headlights look, but what can I do to move past that, you know, at the end of the day? And, and some of the best people that I've interviewed when I was in managerial positions had a good mix of skills. You could sit there and talk to them, the engineering portion, and then switch off with them. And then they pick up on the soft skills too and able to communicate and relay exactly what they want to say at the end of the day, right? If it's wrong, they're okay. They don't get shaken by it. That's just a matter of learning and just a matter of, of more practice at the end of the day. But just having some of these little things here and there, you know, uh, of being able to, you know, 
talk the tech talk, talk the nerdery, and get through that, but at the same time, actually work through the softer skills. Because that's something else that I, I drives my kids nuts. No, no phones, no nothing at dinner. When we're sitting at the table, you're actually going to talk to me. Hey, dad's in town. Congratulations. We get to have a real conversation. And, um, you know, working with them on that, and then kids in their 20s, I'm starting to see a little bit of that, where it's not so much, you're getting it in sound bites. Real quick sound bites, and then tick, 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 tick. You know, it's right back to the device. So maybe trying to reverse some of that. If you get somebody in an interview that you can actually get to expound on what they're trying to say, um, or for the job, to give you a good explanation, not just, oh, type in ls-la. Type in cat, Etsy, password, but right? Trying to get them to talk and communicate and expound on what they know, I mean, is huge. Because for me, personality, being able to work with them, work in the collaborative environment is awesome. For me, tech can always be taught. You know, especially if you know that they have the aptitude for it, they'll jump right in, they'll absorb it, they'll do it on their own, they'll get into it. It's the, the, the guys who are more in it for the money, <laughs> that see that, that big paycheck for InfoSec, that the, the ones that kind of ruin it for the rest of us, right? Who enjoy what we do, who have the passion for what we do, that aren't always requiring the certs to do what we do, but we can display a higher level of knowledge and operation within that and being able to talk to not only our peers, but in helping other people understand what we're trying to get to at the end of the day. But sorry, I'll pass this on. All good. Yes. So I'm not going to do a concur mic drop, even though I did think about it. I did think about it just for just for a quick second. So being the queen of the nerds and uh, doing pen testing full time, you know, a lot of times I get the question, how do I become a pen tester? How do I become an ethical hacker? How do I do that? Um, there aren't as many degree or tailored programs for that now. Um, when I was first learning to do that, there was none of that. So it was something that I kind of fell into over the years. Um, but now, you know, there, there are a lot of cool options out there. So I get this question not just from entry-level folks, but from folks who are, are mid-career, uh, you know, who have been working on the IT side of things for a while, and they want to switch it up. You know, I want to be a breaker. I don't, I don't want to be the fixer of the break-fix situation anymore. I'm guilty of that. I got tired of fixing. I decided that I wanted to play on the break side. But from a resume standpoint, when you're applying, you know, it's a little hard to, to highlight some of your experience and tailor it toward that kind of position. So being queen of the nerds, uh, I usually have to do the technical screening on most of our candidates that we hire uh, because I'm going to be working with most of them. And if I'm not directly, one of my team will be. So while the tech stuff is important, you know, it's awesome to have a background in, in some server management or networking background. You know, it's at the end of the day, it's not all about just that. So for instance, at SecureCon, we have a full-time uh, RF engineer. Yeah, you know, he's not a network guy. He's not a server guy. Um, we have a very specific need for a certain client um, that they need us to play in the RF space all the time. So that's perfect. You know, he's a he's a professional engineer. He has his PE, um, and that's that's his world, and that's cool. Um, but now we're starting to kind of bring him over a little bit into the network world as well, because the same principles that he understands from the RF world also apply on the network hacking side. So, you know, it's it's not that hard to compensate on paper for some of the lack of experience that you have. So if I have a stack of resumes for a position, um, and a lot of them have the same background, you know, I've server 2012, I've been doing you know, this um, system administrator for a long time. That's all really good, solid experience to start from. But now, you know, tell me the stuff that you're doing to to learn about security. All right, consulting is a very, very, very busy profession. So the idea of bringing a more junior person on is, is a little bit scary, gonna be honest, because I have to teach them. And that means that I have to slow down to teach them. So if I'm gonna hire somebody to put in that position, I wanna make very sure that they are here to learn. So some of the cool ways that you can highlight that on your resume, put some of your volunteer work with the community. You know, you volunteer at B-Sides, you help with some of the, the AV and some of the recording, put that on there. Put that under community involvement. Are you studying for a certification? Put that on there too. Yeah, so 
That way, when I pick up that resume, I can see, hey, this person has a really solid background, and they're really making the effort to kind of move into security. And the same can apply if you're still in college. You know, I've, I've done my classes, I'm looking at the certification. Here are the community-based things that I've been doing. Here are some of my self-studies that I've been working on. And that really goes a long way to set you apart from the rest of the candidate pool. All right, I think I'm done talking about candidate pools. Tough to follow. Next. <laughs> now, I couldn't agree more with Valerie on those two major points that she just made, initiative, is huge in this industry, in tech in general. I think a lot of people here can attest to that, especially many of you folks, I'm sure, come from either app dev backgrounds or infrastructure backgrounds. As a recruiter, one of the main things I look for are, are good, is good fodder for conversation. So in other words, if I find somebody that comes from a intrusion detection or a incident response type background, yet they are clearly pursuing a pen tester certification, OSCP, or even something like uh, reverse engineering, the GREM. I like to find people that are pursuing something and just strictly out of initiative, just so I can ask them, you know, look at your background. You don't look like the, the type that uh, would be interested in, you know, reverse engineering. Why are you doing that? Um, it's all about initiative. It's all about people that are seeking edu you know, self-education outside their core strengths, kind of people that are clearly getting outside of their comfort zone because really we can't, as, as human beings, we can't develop ourselves without stepping outside of our comfort zone. So that initiative is huge and, and Valerie hit on that very well. Um, the involvement piece is also huge. Um, I always tell candidates that are humble. I, I love humble candidates, but I love telling them, you know, preach and, and show passion and pride in what you do in the, in the community. Um, I myself can say that I got into cybersecurity because I connected with the right people. And I can say that Mr. Spaulding here is one of those people. Um, but community involvement is huge. Um, whether you're a mentor or a mentee, I like to find people that can still, even if they've been in cybersecurity for over 10 years, they can still tell me who their mentor is and the level of involvement they still have working with that individual just to figure out ways to uh, continue to better themselves. But um, those two things are huge. Diversity is another thing that I look for in backgrounds. A lot of people nowadays still worry that if you bounce around from industry to industry, it might make you look bad in the eyes of a recruiter. I disagree. I think if you're putting forth effort to learn different industries, therefore you can bring more value to new industries. Um, I work with a major healthcare provider uh, as a client in Pittsburgh, for example, and a lot of the folks that I'm bringing over there are from financial backgrounds. Um, and by finance, I mean people that are in security that are coming from the financial industries. But they have, they've learned a lot in those industries and they bring a lot to these new industries. And it's a, it's a nice mutually beneficial relationship. Um, the last thing I want to mention is also prob problem solving. I know it's kind of cliche, but one of the things that I love about Elon Musk and the leaders that work for him at SpaceX, for example, one of the main interview questions that they like to ask is, tell me about a problem that you were tasked with solving, whether it was voluntary or involuntary. How did you go about that? Tell me about the ins and outs of the communication process, who it involved, who were the, pro you know, the troublemakers. Um, being able to go into an interview and have that conversation is huge. Um, it shows, again, initiative. It shows the diversity in your background. But all in all, I know Mike asked us to talk about certifications and education, but at the end of the day, you guys are probably picking up on this, this uh, commonality here. It's, it's more about soft skills. Um, but certifications are a great way to show that involvement, that initiative. Okay. Yeah. And actually, I think Chad just killed many of the uh, topics I had lined off. <laughs> um, no worries. No, no, that's cool. Um, just to kind of get, uh, reiterate what, uh, what Tom, uh, had said, uh, I'll, I'll kind of give away a trade secret that I had running for about three years. I actually used to recruit out of the Apple store. I would recruit kids left and right. And I hate to say it, but I love cherry picking the kids out of the Apple store. <laughs> And anybody, and anybody who wants to come and, I, I, and, and people, people will still argue with me like, well, you know, what about their qualifications for this? I'm like, I have yet to find a kid in the Apple store who really had that passion that's ever let me down. I have yet to have it happen.
So it's kind of like a bit like, like I just had to say it since, since uh, Tom was talking about it earlier, but, but it's true. And just as, and just as Chad mentioned, the soft skills are critical. When it comes to, uh, you know, education, I have to admit, you know, my own personal experiences is that when I go looking to hire, I really don't care where a person went to school. I mean, if you went to Harvard or Stanford, that's great. Hey, that's great. That's good for you. You know, it's probably going to be a differentiator. But to me, I look at the college degree as a, as a tiebreaker. And I've only had to use it once. And I only had to give the recommendation once where, you know, I'm sitting there looking at the two candidates and one's got a degree, one didn't. And I'm like, you know, to me, it's a tie. Give it to the person that put in the time. I, and that's the way I kind of look at it as. Um, but otherwise, uh, you know, you think about certifications, my viewpoint on certifications are that, again, those are kind of, um, you know, they, they show a minimum level of skill. I don't look at certifications as the end-all, be-all. And actually, I've got a ton of them because, you know, I've had employers force me to get them. Um, but... You know, at the end of the day, you look at the certifications and they really, they really are designed to show a minimum skill set. A lot of people don't realize the CISSP was designed to bring together a common nomenclature within the Department of Defense in 1993. That's why they created the certification because some people call it a proxy one thing and another person called it a proxy another thing. And people were confused. So what they did is they said, we're going to go ahead and more or less have a vocabulary test. And it's like, you know, anybody who works in the Department of Defense knows they've got to have a test for everything. <laughs> so if you have a course, you've got to have a test. Even if the test is true-false with 10 questions at the end, and Tom's laughing because he's been there before, they will do that. And that's how the CISSP came about, you know. Um, you know, just kind of, you know, talk about, like, like when you talk about, you know, hiring, you know, young, youngsters out of, out of school. The best person I ever hired was a freshman college, you know, college year freshman dropout. And today he's a VP at Google. He never went back to school. And again, I'm not, I see you got some young kids in here. I'm not saying don't go to school. I think it is important to go to school. Um, it, you know, even with my own son, he's going through that struggle right now too. And, and I'm telling him, I'm like, you know what? You're, you may not make it through an HR hurdle one day. You need to at least go to school online, get your degree. You know, whether you go to MIT or you go to, you know, you go to a, an online school, you, you still got to kind of at least pursue it and at least, you know, you got to go through those check boxes too. So the next question I'm going to throw out here. Uh, okay, we got one. Part of security. You raise a really good point. The way that I kind of viewed security, and if I don't know if anybody, I, I actually spoke at uh, the InfoSec Summit, I think it was two years ago, and I basically, the way I always describe security is the security teams typically, in my opinion, are kind of like special forces. Um, usually, people in special forces, they actually have a lot of the same commonalities because most people who are going into security usually have some bit of background in some little area, whether they, they kind of, you know, they, they went into networking or, you know, and, and just as, uh, just as Valerie kind of pointed out, you know, they went into little key areas or they had their niche. They kind of evolved and move and gradu gravi uh, gravitated towards security, and that's what you find. You find that people gravitate towards security. It's one of those things, like you know, just to come right out and say I'm going to do security. It's kind of a hard thing because a lot of people don't realize, you know, pen testing after a while can get boring. You, you sit there and you look at a screen for twenty some hours, and you, you know, and nothing happens. Yeah, and then you got to write a report at the end, but. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think that's definitely a, definitely a, a key factor. This is not a question for myself, but in a lot of fields, there's age discrimination. Because I have been in the security field. 
Ooh. You're the recruiter. You got the mic. Curveball. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it, we're, we're humans. And nothing nothing is uh, perfect in this world, of course. But the, the short answer is yes, of course, you're going to see that. Um, but at the end of the day, it's how you reflect your credibility on paper. Um, I look for another thing I didn't mention was web presence. Uh, if you've put time into your LinkedIn and it actually reflects well on your resume, it reflects well on your community involvement, recommendations, things like that, age doesn't make a difference. It's really about the impact that you clearly can have solving problems, um, you know, being a representative. I mean, as he, as Mike mentioned, uh, you know, security is basically the SWAT team, but it is, uh, it, uh, it can also be looked at as a cost center in an enterprise. So it's how you represent that team, regardless of age, regardless of color, it doesn't matter. Um, I think the important part is in this digital age is, is really about web presence and again, how you reflect your value add to a potential employer or a potential collaborative partner. Uh, hopefully that partially answers your question. Notice he was uh, in a hurry to get rid of that one. <laughs> Next. <laughs> so personally, um, I have not seen much age discrimination um, being in and out of the Department of Defense, in and out of private industry. Um, you know, normally when we think of age discrimination, we think of older candidates. On the security industry, that can be a great thing because, as Tom had mentioned, there are many operating systems and techniques and just different tools that the younger generation isn't as familiar with. And at SecureCon, we do a lot in the critical infrastructure space. So we spend a lot of time in power plants and um, on systems that are very hmm, antiquated, I guess is probably a good way to put that. Um, so I, I can't take somebody who's never seen the terminal before and just plop them down in front of this very, very sensitive, important device. So um, I think it's important to diversify in age as well. Uh, we've got younger candidates that they they rock at certain things and that's great. Um, some of them we, we have to grow a little bit because at the end of the day, even though we don't like to write reports, we really don't like to give presentations. So when you're telling the client that their baby is ugly and that it's got a problem and we need to fix the baby, um, from a younger candidate, that's not always the best choice to be your presenter. Um, especially, it really depends on the industry, especially in SCADA. Uh, critical infrastructure is a very touchy area. So I, I think that it's more about just using everybody's strengths to the, the certain situation that we need. And now I'm the one that's uh, ready to get rid of the microphone. <laughs> Great. Here you go, Tom. <laughs> no, oh, you know, yeah, I concur. So, uh, you know, it, it's interesting. I haven't, you know, experienced it much either, right? And, and I think, I don't know if it's just because of, of the thought of, um, you know, those who have been in IT and security, older, kind of sage-like, if you will, right? So people generally tend sometimes to go to turn for wisdom, but it's also a delivery mechanism as well. It's much more better received from somebody who has or looks like they've got some years on them and some experience than, you know, having some really brilliant kid coming out of college at 23, 24 coming in saying, your baby's ugly, like Valerie said, you know, and this is what you got to do to fix the baby. So I, I think really, you know, it's, it's more about putting the appropriate person in the appropriate role for the type of delivery that you're doing right at the end of the day um, and that, I think that's the nice thing about some of the IT stuff that I've encountered through my life is it's not so much an age issue but a capability issue at the end of the day you know if you've got a guy who's 60 can code his ass off right no systems inside and out you know he's more than likely to get get hired into that job than some kid, you know, that's 24, 25, maybe has the same qualifications. But it's, again, because it's almost reverse in that, in that, in that sense, right? Because they're going with the guy who they think has the more knowledge. So, you know, that's why I like kind of the anonymity somewhat when we start getting online and we start talking sometimes. Because you don't know. 
you know, if you're talking to somebody who, who may be, you know, 18, 19 years old, or who may be 60, 70 years old, who's just a fantastic, brilliant engineer at the end of the day. And it's, it's nice to kind of have that surprise. So, case, case an example. I was working with a customer doing a lot of phone work, right? A lot of remote work. We're online. We're talking, doing a lot of emails. And, you know, I walk in and they're like, oh, well, that's different. I'm like, okay, what, what's different? I'm sorry. I, am I not wearing the right shirt? Is it not the company colors? They said, no, no, you just, you have a very Irish name and you sound very white. I'm like, oh, well, <laughs> thank you. If you want to find out how Irish I am, we can go for drinks after work. <laughs> Their liver hasn't recovered since. So, it's 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 fun, right? And 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 it's nice. I think being in the in the IT field and security, you know, there's there's a great deal still for us to be able to to be able to set those standards, right? Um, you know, one of the things that I'd like to see even more of at the end of the day are seeing more females in the field. I've talked to some some brilliant women, and I bet you know if I sat down and talked with Valerie, she's probably even more brilliant than some of that I've talked to you know in the past. And we need to start encouraging that type, you know, of of mindset, well, uh, 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 we need to start encouraging that, you know, regardless of the age, regardless of the color, the gender, you know, because, you know, in, in all the Hacker Cheese movies, you know, that stand out to me still, you know, hackers, right? And you've got Mark Anthony of all guys out there talking about the Hacker Manifesto that, you know, that the, the net exceeds all races, all genders, all ages. And at the end of the day, it's kind of true, but we need to start encouraging that more and more because there are things that we all have to offer at the end of the day, you know, especially from the security field, because there are some guys out there, man, I would love to just be able to sit there and just pick their brains, find out what they did, how they did it, and how we can translate that. Same thing with, with younger kids, man. You got guys that are sitting, you know, and, and I know it's the stereotype, in their parents' basements, just cracking away at code and just doing things for the sake of exploration and curiosity. Are there some that are, you know, going to maybe push the envelope a little bit more? Of course course. But there's still the, the, the chance to help guide and direct, you know, and, and those energies into a positive way at the end of the day. You know, not, not all hackers are bad. So, nor are there ages around hackers that I've seen. So, I've actually seen, I think, some really interesting career opportunities, especially the synergy between more mature um, people that are in the infosec space and the younger. Um, it's sort of combining sort of the newer skill sets with institutional knowledge and deep, deep, um, deep knowledge of systems. I think one of the advantages, and some have had new careers in my experience, for example, my son uh, actually works pulling cable. He, he's at college now, but he works uh, pulling cable uh, and stringing it um, in new installations. But guess what kind of a team he's on? It's not just a bunch of 20-somethings. There's the, the leader of his team is actually in his 50s, early 60s, because he's like seeing the gamut of all combinations of buildings and architectural designs and how do you drill holes and where do you do the fit ups. And so you now got the, but he's not the one that's like pulling the cable every, each and every day because he doesn't quite have the physical stamina to do that. We're actually running the lines and you're going out some cases several hundred feet depending on where you're coming in from. So I think there's some really interesting opportunities there because it probably was, you know, Microsoft, as I have this experience from my own background, they made no bones about it. They would hire from some of the best universities knowing they would burn them out over about an eight, ten year period and they'd lose them because they get married, have kids and they become managers and they get the next crew. Um, you have opportunities in this space because the complexities of, of the environments we're in now far exceed the capacity of any one person. But the, one of the capabilities that those that are more mature have is they've seen a lot of this. And they've seen how this industry has grown. So they can bring a strategic perspective with an understanding of the technology, marry that with some of the, with the newer skill sets that are, that are with, with the younger generation, the millennials, Bring those together, and you really have a really a really strong team, because uh, that's increasingly as you. Yes, there's still going to be sort of the lone hacker. There's still going to be the lone pen tester. I mean, I remember spending hours and hours doing the equivalent of, of pen testing in software on networks, 
and you're running through multiple scenarios and boundary testing and you know, all kinds of other scenarios um, and covert channel and, and, and everything you possibly think of in your toolbox, but it was sort of a lonely enterprise. These, when you're doing systems analysis or systems development and our systems of systems, these are, this requires a synergy of skill sets. And I think one of the advantages, and I've seen people actually have created new careers for themselves, even coming from entirely different, I was, I was here for a session on sort of um, the gamification in this space where you actually go out of the box thinking by going into a different domain to see what you can bring back to uh, the skill set you're in. People really respond to that. And so I think here we just have systems that are, I mean, my experience, it doesn't take, you know, remember the five ESS switch for those who go back a few years and someone decided in some room to change a couple lines of code and then propagated it and guess what happened? Cascade failure. Well, a lot of lessons were learned from that. Um, and that's where institutional knowledge, systems engineering, systems knowledge, uh, because you have the experience of those what if scenarios or what could happen if I make this change. Um, and you get to pass on institutional knowledge that can then be coded into the systems that you end up uh, developing and implementing. May I add a parting shot? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Tom, you're very tough to follow, too. So this is me throwing a shout out in the dark. But at the end of the day, age discrimination goes on both ends. Um, really depends on the recruiter. I can tell you from a recruiting standpoint, there are many fantastic, ethical, considerate, just awesome recruiters out there. And there are, with that, many lazy ones, too. And at the end of the day, if they're going to pass on you because they assume that you're too young or too old, uh, you're probably dodging a bullet. That's not the type of person you want to work with and probably not the type of employer that you should be interested in, uh, in joining in the first place. So some words of encour encouragement there, but at the end of the day, young, old, you know, mid-level, if you're taking care of your greatest asset, your reputation, everything else takes care of itself in the long run. So just some parting shots. Yeah, and I have to, I have to admit I agree with uh I agree with what Chad just said and especially on the reputation side. I think reputation matters. Um you know, probably some of the best advice I'd ever gotten uh was from a retired army officer and uh he basically said, you know, your shot at integrity happens once. Once your integrity is lost, to regain it, it's almost impossible. Nobody will ever question you, or no one will ever trust you again. I guess my my big thing when I think about it, like age discrimination, for example, uh, I think you'll find. I think it's out there. I think you see it. I think, in all fairness, I think that uh, younger candidates do have a they have a better advantage. I mean, I'm seeing it myself, and I, and I know that I'm not as fast on my feet as I used to be. Um, there's used. To, I don't know. It's like I hit the age of 38, <laughs> and from there, you know, and I'm in my 40s. <laughs> <laughs> I I don't know. I like I kind of noticed that when I hit 38, things seem to slow down a lot. I, it, it really, you know, I used to be able to, you know, even like today, you know, I only got three hours of sleep. I used to be able to go. I remember once being at the at the Pentagon, and I was up for uh, I think it was like 44 hours or 48 hours, something like that. Something well, it was something was going on in Bosnia. So at the end of the day, like I literally got on a plane, flew to Chicago, and took my CISSP test, in which I was like in the first like couple hundred that actually got it. <laughs> and, uh, and you know, and then uh, caught another plane and flew home after the test. But, you know, it was, it was insane times then. But, but I think young people have a competitive advantage. They have that ability, the ability to learn, the flexibility. I think that's, that's one of the greatest attributes that they have. Um, they do lack experience, but the reality is, is that usually when presented with an opportunity, most young people, you know, they do succeed well. They do well, you know, and they also, you know, low maintenance, as you mentioned with Microsoft, they're low maintenance. They, they cost less. They're cheaper. So. So we got like five minutes left. Is there a burning question or do we want to do like a, a one minute, you know, high speed round? Yep. I have a burning question. So for anybody looking for a job, what about the job interview? 
Uh, okay. Okay. So, so I'm gonna I'm gonna summarize. I'm gonna summarize a question real quick, and we literally have like a minute for each each speaker here. So the the question is is how how is it that we still see the unicorns and the and they're they're technically called the purple squirrels if I'm correct, right? Kitchen sinks. Yeah. All those different names out there, but how is it that we still see those getting posted online? I have nothing to do with those. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really have anything to do with those either, but uh, I guess I'll have a slightly longer uh, response to that. So I don't know if you were at the diversity panel earlier today or not. Um, the, the subject of the unicorn postings came up, and uh, Helen had mentioned how she had noticed a trend where if female candidates didn't meet like 90 to 100 percent of the qualifications, they wouldn't submit. But the male candidates, if they met like 50 or 60 percent, they'd submit anyway. So if they're looking for a unicorn, go ahead and give them their shot at picking you for their unicorn. Just because they want it doesn't mean they'll get it. Next. <laughs> <laughs> so so yeah, the, the mythical unicorn, you know, for sure, I, I still see that. You know, we look at opportunities and you look at that and you're like, really? If I had all those things, I'd be making a million dollars a year. You know, at the end of the day, I had all those skills, qualities, degrees, certs that they're looking for. Um, you know, it, it, and I hate to say it, but same thing. Sometimes you just got to put your resume in and take the shot. You know, and, and unfortunately, you know, I, and I think it's just a conditioning that, you know, that, that women don't do that as often as men. And so, and that's something I emphasize with my own girls. I'm like, listen, take the shot. If you fail, you fail. At least you tried at the end of the day. But try for it. You never know because when you get in there, you start talking to them. You know, and I hate to say this, a lot of times when they post what they want on those job racks, they really don't know what they want. They're just hearing a lot of industry buzzwords and a lot of buzz things that are really cool that they can hire for, right? But when they start getting down to the nitty gritty and you're talking about what the actual job entails, probably a good half of that doesn't even apply at the end of the day because there's no humanly way possible one person is going to be able to fulfill each and every one of those quals at the end of the day. But again, I, you know, don't be risk averse for it. If you see it, apply for it. The worst thing they can tell you is no. The worst thing you can do is to actually ask them what, what are you looking for, you know, at the end of the day. I'll just say it simply, be the unicorn. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Out of fairness, I will add to that, if you don't mind, because um, <laughs> that was unfair. But um, from a recruiting standpoint, uh, to me, I'd, I'd much rather have that unicorn ambitious, is what I call them, that unicorn ambitious description, rather than having a vague one that just wastes time, where you, you raise an eyebrow and then you got to go back to the client and understand really what is it that you're looking for, rather than having that kitchen sink there, because guess what, at the end of the day, that kitchen sink, even if you don't have some of those uh, skill sets, yeah, you can still A, take a shot, but B, you can take away from that description what is being thrown around in the industry, what is the next thing that you could possibly take interest in and learn about if it's if it's popping up in more and more descriptions. Oh, actually, I was going to give my commentary as well. Oh, I know. <laughs> Just real quickly, what I was going to say is when it comes to purple squirrels, my viewpoint is that most people can't afford them. You know, straight up. I can't say how many times people are like, oh, Mike, hey, we love your skill sets. You've got these great things that we'd like to have. And I go, well, here's how much I'm making. And it's not really about money, but what can you provide? And they're like, well, we can't even get close to that. I'm like, um, okay, well, what's on the backside of it? What could I, what could I possibly get out of this relationship? Well, really what we're looking for is we're looking for this purple squirrel and they don't have it. They just don't, they don't have the money to back it up or they don't have, in most cases, you know, just as Lonnie said, they really don't have, they don't have it together. They just put together this laundry list of things and that just don't work. Um, I, I guess my, my big viewpoint that, that, that I would kind of drive towards this whole, you know, you know, when it comes to the purple squirrel is that when it comes to resumes and when it comes to jobs and you're looking for that job, it's all a numbers game. The more you send out, the the better your odds are, and that's really what it comes down to, you know. Going out and 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 actually, when I first got into IT, I was uh, I was doing it during a recession. Um, I think in total, I sent out 
I don't know, probably 50 resumes and finally got calls from two people, you know, and then, you know, right after uh, 9-11 and there's kind of a big law in the IT industry, I remember posting a security engineer role and I got 164 resumes. You know, I mean, that's just, that's just kind of how, how, how that worked. Um, actually, many of them were. It, it was just, it was ugly in 2002. 2002 kind of hit, 2003, and things dried up. I mean, you know, you know, the, the post, you know, Y2K stuff dried up. You had 9-11. Things dried up there. Um, you know, I got laid off in 2002. I mean, they just flat out said, hey, we, we, we know you didn't do anything wrong. Really, our, our, our business is overspent the way that they could handle things. And guess what? You live in a market that we don't see as, as, uh, as profitable and worthwhile. So we're going to let you go. And then next thing I know, I, I actually spent, uh, I think I spent six weeks, you know, before my next job. And then at that time, you know, people were, you know, people were like, you know, wow, that was quick. You did it really rather, rather quickly. Nowadays, you know, you could go find a job tomorrow. That's all great. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I think most of us here have, have viewed this. At least my own personal viewpoint uh, was more from the you know I'm I'm a new I'm trying to get into security or you know many of you I also took it from the management standpoint. You know you're a manager you're trying to find talent. How do you go find talent? And and it's hard. Talent is a, is a huge huge issue. It's a huge problem right now and. Yeah, everybody, everybody, everyone, and, and, and here's the other thing. I can tell you this much categorically, and nobody, well, I'm trying to think if somebody was in the room when this happened. Um, but about a year and a half ago, uh, no, I guess it was two years ago, I actually interviewed for a, uh, or I had someone come in and interview for an information security engineer position, and halfway through, I realized they were lying. Okay, they started giving out all these dates that, that the dates didn't match up, and, and you know, and and everybody on the team was just sitting there, just blown away, like, wow, this person's a phenomenal candidate, you know, and everybody's up there, just, you know, and, oh, this is awesome, this is the best candidate we've had so far, and I started repeating my questions, <laughs> and then the next person, you know, the person next to me started going, you see them, you know, they're they're sitting there on their phone, they're just. Oh, I got it. You know, you, you the tough part I'd say with security right now is you've got a lot of people diving into it who to some degree don't belong and they've lied. And there's people that are going to continue to lie and what they're going to do is they're basically going to they're going to you're going to see in my opinion you're going to see this saturation of security people kind of come in and you're going to see this this big lull of of people who basically aren't really committed to security and what they've done is they've they've kind of you know, just drown the, the security pool, and it's going to give security a bad name. But that's just my opinion. And then this gentleman had a question. Right here in front. No, I, I didn't have a question. Looking at me, resume wise, I'm going to sit in A lot of times they put the words out there. And then that's the weed around. That's how they weed it out. So if I can narrow down a thousand resumes down to two hundred that I have to look at, that's a lot better. And so if it if the if the word in there deters you from putting in your application, that's great. I don't have to look at it. So don't let the word Whatever, I'm close enough, I'm going to 
<laughs> so before we wrap up, any other uh, last minute questions? We appreciate it, you guys. Uh, the, the involvement's been great, and we appreciate all you guys being here. And feel free, of course, to stop us out there. We're, I think most of us are going to be here for the rest of the afternoon. So please feel free to stop uh, stop us and ask us any more personal questions that you have. My own recommendation is if you uh, if you want to reach out to me, hit me up through LinkedIn, and I'll rep reply to your questions. But I, I guess the biggest thing is I usually kind of present it as is, and you know I'm definitely willing to share info. And I think everybody on the panel is willing to always answer a question or or provide feedback and uh, you know I look at it as security is kind of this this big uh, collection of oddballs we're all kind of a little different because you know security people don't think like other people <laughs> Well, again, I think it, I think it boils down to reputation. What are your intentions? You know, I, I'm a recruiter. I started off in sales back in 07, uh, in IT consulting and, you're right. <laughs> right. And I, I still haven't been lit on fire and sent out the door, but, uh, it really is about, it's relationships. It's, you know, 80% of people that get placed. I don't even know where I read this, but 80% are referral based. It's about taking care of your reputation. It's about, showing, you know, from, from a job seeker standpoint, it's about showing initiative. From a professional standpoint or a participant of the community, it's about showing your intentions that you want to give, but you want, you know, you want to give and take. Um, I think we're out of time. Anybody else? We good? Cool. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, guys.